Today's webinar is a bit different since it will take place in two parts. We will explore bioenergy work abroad as it relates to two different sabbatical experiences. In the second half of today's session, we'll hear from Tom Richard and Claire Henricks about the German bioenergy village concept. I'll introduce them a bit later. But first up to speak today is Mike Jacobson, who will relate his experiences working with bioenergy while on sabbatical in Kenya. Mike is a professor of forest resources in Penn State's Department of Ecosystem Science and Management. His work in Kenya and Uganda focusing on oil seeds and biomass pelleting, which he will share with us today, was undertaken in association with the Gatsby Foundation and the International Center for Research in Agroforestry. Mike, the floor is all. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah, for that introduction. And welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Nice and chilly uh, here in State College. When I left uh, home this morning, it was 7 degrees. But uh, anyway, it's part of life here. So I'm going to uh, talk about my sabbatical experience in uh, Kenya. And what I want to do is really talk about some of the experiences I had there. I'm not going to get into too much of the data or the equations and so on. And, but there are some reports coming out if you are interested. One of the take home messages for those who, who have or haven't worked in Africa is it's really tough getting stuff done there. So I spent six months in Kenya between January and June of last year. And I worked on a couple of bioenergy projects. So the theme of this webinar series is obviously bioenergy. So I want to talk, before I get into my specific activities, a little bit in general about energy and its importance in livelihoods. And this map is, or this graph has been shown a lot, but the, the basic take home point is very relevant um, how important energy is and central to our lives. And you can see just the trade offs between energy consumption and human development and just the well being of people. Um, and basically, the green areas at the bottom left are most of the African countries. So just think about it in terms of how important electricity and other energy um, uses are to people. And um, I mean, the, the obvious take home message uh, from lack of electricity in Africa is how can kids study or do homework and get educated if when they go home, they don't have access to electricity? That's just one example. So just a, a, a few more um, things to, to hit home, uh, how Africa differs to many of our developed countries. Um, here we see a graph showing the potential trends or projections in uh, electricity uh, in Africa. And by 2040, we see substantial progress, but still a huge part of the population, even with these optimistic projections, are left without uh, access to electricity. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of young people, one of the fastest growing population areas in the world, and uh, people, a lot of young people looking for jobs and so on, but with no access to electricity. Uh, what, where does that leave us in terms of their livelihoods, benefits, and general uh, educational growth? One more diagram from this publication on Africa's energy outlook, just to illustrate it from a mapping perspective. Um, and basically, northern Africa and South Africa are the only areas that have a fair amount of electricity generation. The country I'm going to focus on in Kenya and in East Africa, I'll show you a map in a second, is one of those countries where very few people have electricity. So. I spent, as I mentioned, my sabbatical in Kenya, which is here on this map. And I focused on two areas. I was fortunate enough to get funding and in-kind services like office and housing from the World Agroforestry Center, the Gatsby Foundation, and EcoZoom, which I'll talk about a little bit later. They work on household wood stoves. So the two areas I focused on um, is the potential for wood pellets at both the industrial and household scale. Now, obviously, we, we you know, I just talked about electricity as an example of energy shortages in Africa. But obviously, there are other uses for energy. And one of the main ones is for heat to generate industrial production and for cooking, which is a huge issue at the household scale. But the idea from the pellets was potentially to make them into sort of 
uh, co-firing co or co-generation uh, gasifier type systems where you can produce the heat and the electricity at the same time. The second project I'll talk about was an oil seed crop. A croton is a tree that produces an oil seed that has potential for biofuel. So just to set the stage in wood energy, specifically in Africa, um, probably pretty familiar with this, but most, most of the people depend on fuel wood or charcoal for their energy uses, mainly for cooking. Um, charcoal has become a key energy source in many countries. Um, and in the next slide, I'll just show you some of the issues with it. But just to point out, it's not just a rural issue. It's an urban issue. Most of the people in urban areas, although they might have access to electricity more than in the rural areas, they still use a lot of these wood fuels, especially charcoal, because it's easier to transport as a cooking fuel in these urban areas, which obviously causes some pollution issues when they, when they use it for cooking. So what are some of the issues with wood energy in general in Africa? And um, the first issue is obviously I put this in as a question mark because of the sustainability. Um, you know, as, as population grows and they, they demand more wood for cooking and converting forest to charcoal and, and other activities related to deforestation, uh, the question is, are we growing enough trees or wood energy to meet those demands? And there's a lot of questions about um, over-harvesting for wood energy. But there's other reasons. There's a lot of deforestation as well, which I won't get into. And then the health impacts, obviously, from using wood to, to cook with, as I'll show you some examples of stoves, we have what's called black emissions. So you know, charcoal is is all over the place. And people in, in the development arena like to look at it as a transition fuel to quote a modern fuel. I don't really like that term, because obviously we're talking about modern use of wood energy. Uh, but you know, people think about wood energy and charcoal as a poor man's fuel. Um, and so we, we, you know, the idea is let's get off wood energy. Let's, let's get off using charcoal. And let's, Let's go to other sources of energy like what we use, which are fossil fuels, which have their own climate issues, right? Right. So um, you know, the, the, this, this thing about you know, wood, because it's cheap, it's readily available. You can go in and harvest um, for free, basically, open access. Uh, it's, it's for poor people. But as I mentioned, a lot of the urban people still like to use it, even though they might have access to electricity. So there's a huge interest in improving stoves, especially wood stoves, even before this transition, if it happens. And because of the, the improved stove's health benefits, uh, but they're only able to reach a few right now. And there's a lot of cultural reasons why people still use traditional stoves as moving to wood. some of the pellet stoves I'll talk about in a minute. And then, as I'll mention in a minute, industry in Kenya and Africa also use a lot of wood to, to create industrial products. And, um, and so that's an issue, too, about the sustainability of their wood supply. So as I mentioned, I'm going to show you a lot of pictures. And just other uses of wood here. This is just around the place I lived in Nairobi. Um, a lot of the construction, the scaffolding is done with wood. Uh, down the road from my apartment, you know, this is this is the type of infrastructure, the typical roads. This is a main thoroughfare, you know, hauling wood um, like this in the in the urban areas. So, what we're interested in is obviously I sort of alluded to some of the issues with um, wood energy and charcoal. So, we we thinking if we can create new biofuel systems that are less polluting, more energy efficient. And take less uh, res uh, take take less wood per energy unit of production, then we can um, you know help sustain the forests and help the livelihoods and help the health of, of people who use these um, these systems uh, for cooking. So briquettes have become quite popular, as you can see those two pictures in the bottom bottom right, you know homemade briquetting. Um, but we're interested in pellets. You know, pellets have taken off in the U.S. Can they work in Africa and Kenya specifically? Uh, but obviously, it's a little more sophisticated in the technology to make pellets than briquettes. 
and obviously a lot more than charcoal. And also there's a lot of questions about equipment, maintenance, and, and how, to, how to create this. So our interest in the work I did was to develop some financial analysis of, of pellet production from the forest to the end user, both for industry and household stoves. So our industry focus was the tea industry. They um, a huge um, sector in the economy. And there's a, a, a Kenya Tea Development Agency. I'm not going to get into them, but they have 66 factories. And they uh, estimated to consume 2% of Kenya's total wood supply, which is huge. And they've come up out from a lot of pressure from folks like the Rainforest Alliance for using indigenous wood. Uh, for heating, for the production of curing the tea. And so the question is, you know, how can they be more sustainable? And maybe pellets or gasifiers or those type of things would be a better alternative. So here's just some pictures of the tea uh, areas in Kenya. You can see the how they prune it every morning, um, just about to harvest the tea. It has to be processed that afternoon. And you can see the mixed landscapes, which within which this occurs. So here's a typical tea factory boiler, old boiler. There's actually a new boiler on the right. But you know they, they're still pretty f inefficient. And you can see just by the size of these logs, um, you know, hard work throwing in huge logs. They're trying to shift to eucalyptus production, because that's an excellent uh, a source of uh, calorific value in heating. So eucalyptus has a lot of potential, but they're still using indigenous wood. And you can still, they, they're still throwing in a lot of uh, wood um, just and, and leaving, the, leaving the furnaces open. Um, just very inefficient boilers, uh, so to speak, and wasting a lot of wood. So the question is, what are, are pellets more feasible? He has, he has a, a well-stacked supply of, of wood to one of the factories. Just a few more pictures to illustrate the situation. Um, and then we can go down from that large scale factory, like the tea industry, to a school. This is a small scale school, about 80 students. And this woman cooks every day in this little enclosure uh, where she uses wood, wood. And you can see the smoke and the issues and the inefficiencies. And there are thousands of schools in Kenya that use wood like this every day at different scales. So can we create pellet stoves at the institutional level? And at the at the household level, to to be more efficient. So that's where the EcoZoom company I worked with. They've been making improved wood stoves and improved charcoal stoves. But what I helped them with was to test some gasifier cook stoves that use pellets. And you can see in the bottom right, they all prototypes right now. But the basic idea is when we use the the pellet gasifier stoves, um, there's going to be no smoke, and it's going to be uh, we wanted to see what the, the trade-offs were. Obviously, one of the issues is that people are used to wood and, and charcoal. So getting them culturally into, into wood pellets is an issue. And then we need to think about the supply of the wood. You know, I talked about some of the deforestation issues. So eucalyptus plantations and small-scale growers supplying the industry and for the pellet production. and using some intercropping technologies, as you can see in the bottom right, where you have nitrogen fixing trees that also provide fertilizer for the maize, which is in between the rows. So we started to look at uh, pellet production. And, and obviously, sawdust um, is, a, is a fine material. And so we went to the centers of where the, the, the forest production is. And we saw piles of sawdust by some of these um, uh, factories where they, they create timber that's just being unused. So that, that would be a great source of pellets, uh, a fuel a source of feedstock for pellets. Here's just examples of piles of unused sawdust that, that no one uses, and the slabs and the, and the unused portions of the saw timber that's not merchantable. So sometimes people come in, and I'll just show you some pictures of, of People come in and picking up some of these slabs. But it's, it's great material. He has just more waste material that would be able to be used for pellets. So 
you know, without going into detail, we've created some financial models to look at the viability of producing eucalyptus and other fast-growing species to, to meet the pellet market and then what would the pellet production entail and is it financially feasible and whether local communities are would adopt it. And we have some trials with EcoZoom to look at using these pellet gas fire stoves and working with the tea industries to see if they want to convert their boilers to more efficient gasifier type pellet systems. So that's where that is ongoing. Okay, a few minutes left to just talk about the other project, which is um, on Croton, as I mentioned. And it's a huge, and it's a tree that's widely abundant in Kenya and East Africa in general. That's basically been ignored for years. I mean, people have used it in their homes for fuel wood, charcoal, fence post. It makes a great fence post, good for shade, has some medicinal features. But it was usually just there in the communities. And it's, we know it's very abundant, but very little work has been done on it. But now, because it produces this oil seed that I'll show you in a minute, there's potential for biodiesel or other oils. Um, and then the byproducts, the seed cake, after you squeeze out the oil, um, can be used for animal feed and the poultry apparently uh, like that. And then there's also potential for the husks and the bi other byproducts to be made into fertilizers and biomass. So there's a double benefit from this tree in terms of the oil and the biomass byproduct for energy as we just talked about. So here are some pictures of croton in the landscape. It's, it's widely abundant around farms and houses. And so a company has initiated some activity. And here you see this is the seed. Um, and here's the company that is actually here. They're laying out the husks for drying to make into fertilizers. A very small scale. But because this, the tree is so abundant, the question is, can we scale it up? What will we have to do to, to make viable livelihoods for these people who collect it? And, and what about processing and markets for these croton products? Here's a picture of the, um, the oil seed, uh, the press that presses out the oil. And so what we did um, with funding from the World Agroforestry Center was a few preliminary surveys of the collectors to find out uh, a little bit about them. And I've written up some of this. I'm going to be doing more work this year on this. But we want to get into detail to really look at the impacts on their livelihoods from collecting, scaling up, and, and how they can get involved in the processing and the marketing and downstream active activities. It's widely abundant, and this, and so we, we feel there's a lot of potential for it. Obviously, there's some issues that we look at in the communities about, you know, when they collect the seed, how do they store it? Because it degrades pretty fast if they don't have good storage facilities. It's a great thing for children to collect, but, you know, what are the implications from them not going to school and those kind of, of things in the community? I mean, these, these seeds just fall to the ground prolifically, unused, and so have a huge market potential. And then, you know, if we're going to scale up, uh, you know, what are the opportunity costs of labor, the collection time, how far do they co have to go to collect, and so on. And then there's the whole, from the company perspective or the process perspective, the whole logistical chain, supply chain to get it to the processing. So where I've left it are some, some key gaps and recommendations that we're going to continue to work on is we know that the tree is abundant, but you know that's one thing. But how available is it in terms of economics and scaling up? I mentioned some of the collection site issues, um, you know, just the storage, the logistics. And then if we're really going to scale up production, you know, do we need to plant croton, or is there enough in the wild? or along the fence rows and the houses, as you saw in those pictures. How can agroforestry get it, contribute to that? And then to get production efficiencies, both at the community level and downstream, what kind of incentives and, and logistics do we have to deal with? And then finally, and importantly, is the production mix of these products. Because you know there's 
In fact, right now, because of the low cost of oil, biodiesel, we can't sell it as biodiesel. We're selling it as actually paint thinners and for leather tanneries. So, so the question is, the byproducts actually have more value currently than the oil. So how can we develop optimal product mix, new markets, next markets? I think the seed cake for the poultry industry is a huge uh, uh, potential. And then there's obviously the government role in, in, in pushing some of these renewable energy sources. So with that whirlwind tour, um, I'll leave you with a decent picture of Mount Kenya. That's where a lot of the croton activity is and also a lot of the timber production. And just a typical picture of driving anywhere crazily in Nairobi. And a picture of the Rift Valley, which you've probably heard of. And this is uh, just a nice morning drive before the mist um, evaporates. So with that, I think that's my last slide. And I don't know if we're taking questions now or at the Yeah, uh, let's let's do a round of questions now. Um, so while we're on the subject and while it's fresh in our minds, I'm going to bring us back to this very nice picture while we do it. Uh, we had one com question submitted from Tim who asks about uh, your economic models and financial models that you built uh, looking at those firewood logistic streams. He asks about the cost of pellets based on your research, uh, what you would you would guess it might be for a small scale system like the one you described in the schools. Uh, compared to what they would now pay for firewood, challenges that would make that switch difficult. Yeah, great question. So we've we've done some preliminary data. Obviously, the cost of the pellets is going to be related to scale and distribution. So our idea was to develop a pellet plant that could um, also provide pellets to the industry as well as sort of not the waste but the leftovers going to the households. Um, you know, and so the, the the question on the economic feasibility, I don't have the numbers in front of me, and I forget. But but we you know we we are we have found that it, in terms of uh, the household level, um, using the gasifier stoves, they can it compares with charcoal what they're paying for charcoal now in the market. If you take into account the the energy savings from using the pellets, you use less wood, so you buy less volume of, of, of pellets than you would the volume of charcoal. And so, but we do realize that there's going to have to be some kind of subsidy or incentives for them to get going in the short term. Um, on the industry level, we haven't really looked at that, but we're working on different pelleting systems. We've talked to some companies in the US and in Scandinavia. Uh, there's very little pelleting in Africa, so and another big issue is the distribution of the pellets to these communities. Um, so there's still a lot of questions. I just read the questions, and so uh, I'll, I'll read them off so that we have a record. Okay. So uh, th thanks for answering that question. Uh, the next question relates to the the Croton project you worked on. So this is something we see in American markets too, where depending on market factors, the relative value of these several different products that come out of that uh, that whole seed really vary depending on, on on market factors. So Tom asks if you have estimates for the relative value of the oil that comes from that process versus the meal uh, or the residues. So he, he cites that for, for soy biodiesel in the US, about 60% of the value is in the high protein meal as a livestock feed, which we would consider a byproduct from a bioenergy perspective, uh, mm -hmm. but which a, a livestock producer would consider the primary product, while only 40% of its value is with the vegetable oil. And a few of our colleagues here have even said uh, that the oil itself, if it's an edible oil, may, may be a higher value than turning it into biodiesel too. So can you give some perspective on sort of how those markets are playing out in Kenya? Yeah, good good question, Tom. You know, the, the problem in really doing the analysis is the production is very small scale. I think they do about 50 tons a month. Um, and so, and the markets are rare, as I mentioned, the, the oil markets, they're right now selling to leather leather tanneries and the paint for paint thinner. Um, and, um, you know, they're struggling with the marketing. And they don't have, and the poultry industry, the, as you say, the byproducts, the, the meal for the livestock is, 
is potentially very lucrative, but the, the poultry companies are interested in in supply, and the amount of supply that these com the company can give them right now is pretty minimal. But the numbers I've run, and be happy to share a little more with you on, is um, that yes, the byproducts at the going prices for the oils are uh, are fetching more value for the company than the oils. So that's, but I think a, a lot depends on what they can get for the oil. But I agree with you, it's probably going to be the byproducts edging it out. So it's really important. Do you see that as a beneficial sort of transitional opportunity? Or uh, do you see that as, as an issue with competition for uh, a bioenergy resource? You mean for the or oil? For yeah, those, those other markets having high value. Well, no, I, I think, you know, for example, the poultry companies are importing uh, feed right now, you know, so if they can get local feed from the seed cake, that's a win-win. I mean, the oil prices are driven by world markets, so to speak, um, but, I mean, I th as I mentioned, I think there's other niche markets that are potentially there, um, but at this point, just doing the numbers on what the company is getting for uh, uh, oils versus fertilizers um, and the other seed cake byproducts, the byproducts. Does that okay, answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Our next couple of questions bring us back to the, the pellet issue. So um, Justin asks if the, you, you mentioned a couple of, of consolidated areas uh, providing uh, wood, wood residues. So he asks if those pellet feedstocks are close to areas where those pellets are utilized. So does the supply match demand on a location yeah. basis? Yes, yeah, so you saw those pictures of the piles of sawdust and the, all the waste wood. Um, good question. And so, yeah, that's really where a lot of the, 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 the timber production is. And um, uh, so we're interested in the tea industries, for, for example, and they're not that close. But we do feel that there's other industries in that area that, for example, we visited a company that's um, making paperboard, and they're using heat to, to you know, dry the paperboard, and so, and they're using wood right now very unsustainably, like the tea industry, and they're just down the road. So um, I think there would be matches, and obviously, as Justin notes, um, transportation. Okay, um, our, our next question asks about the basic issue of pellets versus briquettes. What's the difference in production efficiency? Is one uh, just friendlier to implement than the other? What's yeah, driving your market towards pellets? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not a fan of briquettes. Um, for, if, you th if you saw those pictures a little carefully, you'll notice that they, I mean, they're easy to make, but they're awkward to burn. Um, especially in a in a household cook stove, you know, unless they're really into small pieces like charcoal is or 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 pellets would be, you know, briquettes are chunky and so they don't burn as well. And there's a lot of issues with you know when you make briquettes, uh, they, they're adding a lot of um, interesting materials. Like I know some of the briquette makers in Kenya are adding molasses, um, and and that's not the greatest. Uh, um, liquid or um, amendment to add into making briquettes from a heating perspective. Um, it, it's, a, it's good for molding the briquette, but so the issues with just um, their uh, utility in and functionality in these stoves um, compared to what we think pellets can do in burning much more efficiently. And that's probably why, just speculating, why, why haven't briquettes taken off in the US? or Europe compared to pellets. Same kind of thing. The thing with pellets is they're very, I mean, with briquettes, they're very easy to make. All you need is a, is a press, a little handmade press, and you can press out briquettes. Pellets, obviously, is a whole, whole different. So if you're going to switch to a densified fuel, um, you should go all the way and, and choose the one that has the greatest advantage in terms of efficiency and, and storage ease. Yes. Well said. Um, so if there are any last minute questions for Mike, feel free to type them in. We have a couple minutes. But I guess my, my who are on this webinar and who are working 
working with you, Mike, uh, are dealing with the development of, of bioenergy markets in the North American Northeast. So uh, is there anything from this that you would take away that, um, that you would pr want our audiences to hear that applies um, based on your work in Kenya that, that we should sort of take to heart as a lesson as we explore the development of these markets in the Northeast? Um, excellent question. I wish I'd thought about it beforehand. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we, if, you, if you think about the issues I'm looking at, they are related to here. Yeah, the supply chains for pellets, for example. Um, you know, there's interest in oilseed crops in, in America now um, as biofuels. Um, but, but obviously there's different um, institutional, cultural, and economic issues in Africa. But I think the general, the general um, concepts of issues promoting to energy development um, are similar. And so we can learn lessons. And that's what, what I want to take back is, is what I've learned from learning about you know, pellet supply chains and bringing them back to talk about some of the supply chain issues we deal with. So that's an example of that. Certainly. Um, and why don't I spin that question back around to incorporate the question that Peter just submitted. Uh, he asks about transportation issues um, on the logistical spectrum that are very specific to the landscape in Kenya. Is transport of raw materials and products a, a huge issue there due to poor roads and rains uh, with other weather pa patterns and other issues? Yeah, so there's logistical nightmares, frankly. Um, you know, just to get a pellet, um, just, to, just to get, you know, since no one's making pellets in Kenya right now, we had to import pellets. And we've been looking from Zambia, where there is some small scale, but, but mainly from Europe. And it's just, just getting it through the ports and then from the coast up to where the forested areas is. Um, it's not only um, uh, an economic nightmare from the duties and the imports and the fees and the waiting, but yeah, the the the, the logistics on the roads are very difficult, um, and so that obviously puts another constraint on it. So, the key, and I think one of the messages we've learned from our projects is, you know, a lot of the production and the supply chains need to be locally driven, and minimizing transportation costs is is important. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mike? Uh, go ahead and type them in. In the, in the meantime, I'm going to switch to our next presentation, if that's all right. So at this point, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for the second half of today's presentation. Tom Richard and Claire Henricks have been on the faculty at Penn State University since 2004. Tom is a professor of agricultural and biological engineering and directs the 500 faculty strong Penn State Institute of Energy and the Environment. He also serves as the project director for the New Bio Project. Claire is a professor of rural sociology in the Department of Agricultural Economics, Sociology, and Education. She also contributes to the human systems research team within New Bio. Tom and Claire spent January to June of 2015 on sabbatical leave at Freiburg University, Penn State's global engagement network partner in Germany. While living in southern Germany, they enjoyed hiking through the Black Forest region, where they saw many examples of Germany's current innovations in renewable energy and sustainability, which they have graciously offered to share with us today. So Tom and Claire, uh, go ahead. OK, well, thank you very much, Sarah, for that introduction. And welcome, everybody, to the webinar. So Freiburg, for those of you who may not know, is tucked in the southwest corner of Germany, right on the edge of the southern Black Forest and not far from the Rhine River. And while Tom and I were there, uh, we were engaging with academic colleagues. Tom was working with people working in forest sciences and management, and I was working with people um, in the area of environmental governance. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is not a formal research project, but really um, a, a product of our um, wanderings through the region, one that provided some intersection between Tom's work as an engineer and mine as a rural sociologist. OK, Tom. OK, um, so the bioenergy villages. Um, well, as, as webinar participants may know, Germany has embarked on a significant uh, policy program of um, what they call energy venda or energy transition. And this is all part of shifting the country from conventional fossil energy use 
to renewables and energy conservation. So what exactly does energy transition mean? Well, specifically, it's a very ambitious goal that Germany has taken on of um, shooting for 35% of its electricity to come from renewable energy sources by 2020, and at the same time to be cutting consumption. So it's within that context that we want to talk to you today a little bit about the bioenergy village movement, which is a very fascinating small part of this German energy transition. So um, is this a uh, uh, slice from a, a, a web page um, of the German government shows um, the number of ways that villages become bioenergy villages. And at this point, um, 176 German villages have actually committed to the, the goal of more than 50% of their energy coming from biomass. Um, some 120 are actually already doing this, but another 56 have signed on to do this. So I think by those standards, it's quite fair to say that this is a fairly significant movement amongst rural communities um, and actually dispersed throughout the country. Okay, now this slide, um, Zukunft equals the future. I want you to forgive our feeble German, but we really want to stress that this effort to encourage and support rural villages in their transition to renewable energy is a forward-looking venture. And that's pretty interesting because in many cases these are really very old, long-established villages that are um, heading into the future by uh, sorting out an emphasis on bioenergy and, as you'll see, tying that into um, other facets of renewable energy and conservation and sometimes other kinds of activities in the area of agriculture. So when did the bioenergy village movement get underway? Well, it actually began back in 2004 when 750 residents of the small village of Yunda near Göttingen joined together uh, to build a bioenergy plant that they were going to fuel with plant material and manure. They had a fair bit of support from an institute at the nearby university, and through that process, um, the residents formed a cooperative. And they managed eventually to supply all of Yunda's heat and even sell electricity back to the grid. This example became inspiring to other, other villages in Germany and actually caught the attention of government agencies. And to make a long story short, the German um, the German government has been very supportive, has provided um, sort of planning resources and sometimes funding resources as well to enable other villages to become bioenergy villages. So what are some of the criteria that um, the German Ministry of Food and Agriculture has around bioenergy villages? Well, um, the, re the requirement is that at least 50% of the community's energy needs, electricity and heat, be supplied by locally produced bioenergy. And that's really the central criterion. But another um, is that local citizens and residents are expected to be highly involved in the specifics of uh, developing the plans and actually making the decisions of how to proceed um, specifically in that community. The biomass um, is to be owned at least partially by the villagers and is grown and harvested locally using sustainable practices. Um, there's also an expectation that other renewable energy sources will be explored um, to the extent that's possible to supplement the generation of power and heat from biomass. And energy efficiency and energy conservation are considered throughout. So a lot of attention to creating value locally in these places, um, but with consideration to how the benefits extend regionally. So next slide, Tom. Okay, so five pillars um, define bioenergy villages. The saying goes that bioenergy villages are really all different, and that is because they are so um, rooted in the specifics of the, um, the sort of ecological places where they're located and also the local cultures around the country. But these are the five pillars um, that are critical. And you'll see that um, you know, some of these are technical and production-oriented around electricity production, heat production, energy efficiency land use management, but there's also um, this important element of civic engagement. Um, from the Institute for Applied Resource Management in Germany, which has been critical in fostering this movement, really both the technical and social elements um, are central to the bioenergy village concept. And as I stressed before, um, this this has included a great deal of emphasis on early and sustained involvement of villagers in planning and organization, which then lends itself to sort of diverse manifestations of the bioenergy, um, bioenergy villages. 
And Tom, I'm going to let you take over slide five. So this is just a simple schematic of what some of the bioenergy villages have structured. And, um, and I'll just, the, the elements are, I think, pretty obvious to most of the people watching this webinar. Um, there are various kinds of inputs over on the right, um, manure from dairy cattle or other livestock, um, also plants and, and silage. Um, in fact, some of the feed-in tariffs in Germany early on when they started this uh, process of energy transition were up to 30 cents a kilowatt hour. And some dairy farmers found that they made more money feeding their silage to their digesters to make electricity than they did feeding it to their cows. So manure, crop residues, and sometimes whole plants um, fed to biogas digesters. And that, of course, can produce electricity as uh, well as some waste heat, which is usually used to heat the digester and sometimes hot water for the dairy. There's also forest wood. And again, um, Germany is an urban country, but with lots of forests. Um, not unlike the, the northeastern United States. And uh, that can be used in a variety of ways. Of course, uh, home stoves, uh, pellets, wood stoves, but also in, in many of these villages, central heating plants. And, and in many cases, those are combined heat and power plants where they're producing um, electricity, but also using the waste heat from that electricity production to feed a district heating system. And, and that's illustrated by the, the little houses over on the left of this figure, uh, which are being fed heat from the centralized wood burning uh, plant and also electricity that could be coming from the biogas digester, but also could be coming from uh, wind power or uh, solar. Uh, I'll note that the, the Black Forest is in the far southwestern corner of Germany. And so the circle on this figure to the right uh, illustrates that region. And you'll note the relatively high concentration of these bioenergy villages down in that area. One of those villages is St. Peter. And it's uh, a, a close, uh, probably a 30-minute bus ride from Freiburg, where we were located. It uh, is a, a small village that is centered around an abbey, the Abbey of St. Peter, which is uh, been in place for hundreds of years. And, um, and there's a nice community of homes. And uh, many of the people that live there work down in Freiburg, which is a big town uh, close by. But some are in involved in various rural activities. Um, there's also a shopping district, et cetera. This is the St. Peter website about their bioenergy door for bioenergy village program. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this figure, but uh, just note that they, they have uh, a lot of wood stoves, about 7,500 megawatt hours per year of heat from individual stoves. The uh, central heating plant, the district heating plant that's combined heat and power provides another 2,100 megawatt hours of, of heat. Solar thermal, they have a solar thermal plant, uh, small, but it's providing a, about 40 megawatt hours. And renewables generate, in total, over 80% of the community's heating needs. There's also electricity. And the biggest source of that is wind, with 18.4 million kilowatt hours per year. And that's more than double the community's needs. They've got about 1.4 million kilowatt hours per year of electricity from the CHP plant, and another 1.2 million from solar, 400,000 from some small hydroelectric plants. Together, they, they produce on the electricity side more than three times what they need. And this figure here um, is just a little graph I put together with the data from their website um, illustrating what that heat consumption is which is the black bar on the left, and the heat production. Again, mostly wood stoves, but a, about 20% a, a of it from their centralized combined heat and power system, and a bit from so solar. And then on the right, the electricity consumption and the electricity production. And so all told, uh, this, this particular village is not only um, producing the, the basic criteria of the bioenergy village of producing more than 50% of its uh, energy needs from biomass, but it's producing three times its electricity from uh, 
electricity needs from renewables and exporting that to the region. When they put in the combined heat and power system, they did have a, an infrastructure project. They basically had to dig up the streets of the village and put in that district heating system. These are uh, uh, pipes that go to individual homes. Uh, those homes then can put in essentially radiators to, to tap that heat and heat themselves up. Down in the bottom right of this figure are just a couple of slides of that central heating plan, a relatively small structure, um, not unlike some of the uh, fuels to schools or uh, school-sized or ind small industry-sized power plants that we have here in Pennsylvania. There are about 220 heat customers on, in the district and 20 farms that are providing biomass supply. And this is very much a community-involved uh, practice. One of the uh, lecturers that was working in the, the research group I was uh, stationed with in Freiburg is uh, both a resident of this village and also a member of the governing council for their uh, bioenergy program. Here's another slide of the wood chip boiler. And uh, uh, they're using wood pellet gasification for the combined heat and power. So they have couple systems inside the building. There's a little uh, a green sign you can see, a, a flag on the side of the building. Here's a close-up of it, uh, essentially stating that we are the energy transition. Um, and uh, again, some local enthusiasm for what is a, a very strong national program. Here's a slide of the Abbey. This is the largest user uh, of uh, heat from the district heating system and uh, a, a major sort of local economic development opportunity. Uh, the the Abbey's existed for many hundreds of years as a religious institution, but has uh, been secularized and now has a, a number of different programs in it, including uh, residential programs, retreats that people can come uh, and reflect. Uh, and there's also a, a gorgeous library uh, that's set up in a, a, a region of the Abbey there. I mentioned the, the very large component of renewable electricity produced uh, by the village uh, through wind. And this is uh, just a slide of that wind installation. Um, it's a small village, so it's not a, as big as some of the wind installations that we have here in Pennsylvania or other parts of the US. But again, it's producing three times the village's needs in this field of, of wind, uh, wind turbines just outside the village. There's also the hydro and solar, and, and this is an older hydro water wheel. Um, this isn't actually contributing a lot in terms of electricity, um, nor the solar thermal, but it's illustrating how they're using uh, some indigenous resources to try to maximize the benefits and uh, use renewable energy where they can. And this is just a slide of the forest, uh, which is actually a very popular hiking area, but um, very manicured. Uh, the, the forests in, across Germany, but particularly in the Black Forest, are uh, managed very carefully. Uh, you know, essentially every tree is, uh, is watched and selected and, and logged at the appropriate time, either in a thinning operation or uh, for timber. And the bypro byproducts of that timber production are used for uh, wood energy systems. Okay, well, I'm going to back out again um, a little bit from the specifics of this uh, brief tour of St. Peter's, which was very close to Freiburg and which we had the pleasure of um, visiting at some length, and talk a little bit about uh, what research is showing about the typical process uh, that, that's undertaken in terms of developing these bioenergy villages. So um, it really does start with um, a locally initiated idea, that is the motivation um, from some, some small cluster of people within a particular village. The next step tends to be scoping uh, local energy needs and sources, so both to understand what the residential and commercial needs are within the village and perhaps the slightly larger district, but also to understand um, the sources in terms of biomass, wind possibilities, and so on and so forth. The step of surveying community interest is pretty critical um, in, in terms of ensuring that there's more than just a, a, a few members of the community that want to go forward with, forward with this, because it is a fairly involved organizational process, and it isn't something that's going to be done overnight. Um, 
the pattern seems to be now that there are plans developed for phased phased development of the bio bioenergy um, village context in a particular place. Um, and this is, this is reasonable in terms of um, accessing the funding for this and so on and so forth. And then the next step would be seeking financing. Um, and this is often um, funds that are raised both within the community, but there are also, of course, um, possibilities in terms of funding through either the, um, the, the, the local state or the, the regional state or the federal government. And then feasibility study is a key piece. The recommendation that's come out of um, from planners and government people that are working with this is that this be done very much through committees or working groups. And one of the logics for this is to allow people to um, contribute in areas where they might have particular facility or interest. So um, the recommendation is to have planning groups say that are focused on management or perhaps on the technology, on biomass feedstocks in particular, perhaps financing um, a committee focused maybe on communications and public relations. So this process, both the social organization and the technical components, um, and particularly the fact that the Germans have been pretty good about documenting this, um, has generated a great deal of interest um, around the world. Aside from individuals like ourselves that have gone because we knew some people and we liked hiking in the area, I'm told that um, delegations from countries such as Japan, China, and India have been visiting German bioenergy villages. Some of them visiting that first village that I spoke of, Yunda, um, that really launched the movement, but also going to places like St. Peter. So what this does is it helps to spread the idea, um, and it also creates some exchange um, so that um, you know, people are finding opportunities, able to think about how they might adapt this model to the different contexts in their own regions or places. Um, I think it's worth mentioning, too, that these visitors, um, these delegations, tourists like ourselves, provide some knock-on rural economic development impacts for these villages. They become, in effect, um, rural, rural energy um, tourist destinations, if you will. Okay, and, um, and a little bit then on um, successful bioenergy villages. The concept is still relatively new, only about a decade um, old in terms of its formal uh, formulation in Germany. But we are beginning to see some research um, uh, that's attempting to understand what the distinctive features are of the initiation process, and more importantly, what seems to allow um, bioenergy villages to succeed. Uh, the social scientists that have looked at this really stress the importance of social capital. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that term, it simply refers to the social ties, the collective goodwill, the mutual caring in a community. It's the connections between um, individuals and different groups within a community that actually allows things to get done by people working together. Social scientists talk a lot about the difference between bonding and bridging social capital. And bonding is sort of the relationships between people in a particular place, but relationships that bridge out to other agencies, other communities, um, other important players, um, perhaps technical expertise outside the actual geographic community can be really important as well in getting this done. Another important feature is the balance between uh, leadership and collective action. Um, a number of people that have written about the bioenergy villages stress the essential role of what in German would be called Zugferde, that is draft horses, someone locally who is just willing to be a champion of this effort. But it's also um, the case that, um, and this is where the research is a bit interesting, that sometimes overly strong um, and directive leadership can dampen collective involvement, and then you don't have as much widespread cooperation. So there's a certain kind of balance in this. Um, another thing that's been stressed as important is um, shared access to information and trust and a transparent process. And so there's a lot of emphasis in the bioenergy village movement on monitoring, especially regarding costs. Um, and that if this is done in a, in, in a conscientious way and the information is readily available, this can help to foster community buy-in. So what are some signs of success? The kinds of things that social scientists and planners are talking about is, you know, are these villages retaining youth? That is, youth not feeling that they have to leave. Are they generating, um, you know, employment opportunities? Are they even um, inspiring the return of young adults who have perhaps gone off to the city? Is there that eco-energy tourism 
development factor? Um, are they connected in any ways to the expansion or the add-ons of other renewable energy technologies, um, sustainable food systems, and other sorts of things that you know would be part of sustainable rural communities? So these are some of the things that people are looking at. So we're about out of time, but I wanted to give you a little sort of windshield tour of, of the big city near St. Peter, uh, Freiburg, which is a university town, uh, again, one that we're uh, involved with uh, in a cooperative agreement with Penn State. Um, it's also uh, a fairly large and relatively wealthy town, about 250,000 people. And they're, they're also very uh, engaged with renewable energy. Uh, they've had a, a strong effort in solar with homes, with garages, with uh, um, a lot of new innovative structures and several solar businesses that have, have uh, evolved in the region. Um, there's also biomass combined heat and power plants uh, in, in, the, in the city. Um, and hydro plants. This is a more modern hydro plant. It's a run of the river hydro plant uh, along the main river that runs through town. The, uh, the streetcars or um, local urban rail are electrically driven uh, using biomass and solar energy. So uh, essentially riding on the renewables. And, the, and then to step back a little bit, sort of national goals um, going towards that that bioenergy or that uh, energy transition include 23 percent of the the nation's um, demand for energy being being from bioenergy by 2050. So fairly aggressive goals. I just wanted to take a, a moment to point out that here in the U.S. Um, we'd had a, a bioenergy based system 150 some years ago, and um, whether we can get to the same kind of direction is certainly a challenge, but I think what Germany is showing us is that it is possible. It's possible both in urban and in rural areas, and that bioenergy can play a very important part in that transition to renewables. So a couple of references here, um, and I'll go ahead and just jump right to the questions. Yeah, so if you're able to stay on a few minutes after two, uh, I really would like to get through all of the questions that you have. This has been a, a really fantastic presentation. So uh, our first question is basically, how is it paid for? Um, when you showed that map of the district heating pipes being put in, clearly that's a very large undertaking. What's the economic basis for that? So in the, in the case of St. Peter, the, um, there is a cooperative that uh, was formed to set up the bioenergy system. It's a member-based cooperative, and those members uh, had to make financial investments in order to join. Um, they then also uh, pay regular costs for maintenance, etc. Um, there are there, there was some financial support. I don't know the details of it, um, but there was very strong participation within the village, and, and many of those local leaders that Claire was talking about are, are um, both members of the cooperative and village leaders. Um, there, there was a question uh, about the sort of overall enthusiasm, and, and, and I think one of the reasons that this is working so well in, in the uh, um, rural areas is because there is a sense in Germany that rural life is a good thing, and yet it's a hard thing to maintain good jobs in rural areas. And so, so having um, a local economic development opportunity, such as producing local energy, um, brought some higher quality jobs to the region um, and, and helped to maintain some economic development opportunities. So to expand on that, uh, we have a couple of questions related to sort of sociological factors and demographics of these systems. So before I get into the um, that sort of stickier question of, of willingness and sociology, uh, I'm going to ask a question about scale. So David asks, uh, of the 120 villages that are already doing this, are they comparably sized uh, to St. Peter? How far along are they towards their goal? Um, so clearly scale probably has some impact on how well received this is. He, and he also asks about um, you know, rural versus urban groups uh, being more or less receptive to this. So we don't have a very um, statistical <laughs> analysis of the system. Tourism. <laughs> but, but I will tell you that those 120 villages have already met the, the target 
50% of their energy from bioenergy. That's that you can't be a bioenergy village. You don't get the designation without achieving that. So, so all of those villages have at least 50%. The other, uh, what, 40, 56 of them that were on the list, they're... On the drawing board. They're, they're targeting that. So, but anyway, this is a, a substantial effort, and those are, I would say, at over 50% from bioenergy, they are successful. Uh, they do range in scale. I don't know what the largest uh, village is. Yeah. They're, not, they're not big cities, but, um, but they're, you know, typically a few thousand people. And, um, I think they're probably all under about ten thousand. That that would be uh, you know that that's my. Okay. Yeah. And do you have a sense of uh, first? Can you remind us of the time frame that those successful villages were working with between initiation and final implementation to the levels it of their to goals? Be over a three to four year period. Um, and there isn't a whole lot of research on this. Um, after we came home, I, be, I did a little digging around, um, mostly to look at the um, sort of the, the socio-technical interface on this. And there's not a great deal of um, really systematic evaluation, um, partly because it hasn't been going on for all that long. But at least some of the um, reports on uh, you know what the process is suggest that you know it, it does tend to be done in phases. It uh, so there's a sort of modular dimension to it, but sort of from, you know, idea to, um, you know, full execution is. Wow, that's, that's very quick indeed, um, especially, you know, when we consider how long it takes just to get ideas off the ground. Um, that's, that's very interesting. But uh, that may, come back. No. Go ahead. Uh, but I'm, that may be around getting the 50% um, you know, um, energy from biomass. Some there, you know, there are other things that can be added on later in terms of you know, s s say a wind component or um, you know some of the other features that we were talking about. Okay, thanks. Uh, I want to return to a question that was submitted by uh, by someone who logged in as guest only. Sorry, I I, I can't give their name. Um, they asked about aside from the district heating construction you saw. Did you see much evidence of siting issues or other concerns that are typical in the U.S. regarding uh, immediate neighbor concerns? So I'm assuming this is a sort of not in my backyard argument, mm -hmm. um, especially when facilities are scaled larger than for local use. Um, if there's little evidence of concern, what in the community participation structure or cultural environment makes this situation different from what we commonly find in the Northeast? So you already cited a few of the characteristics that are really essential for a successful project, but are there specific differences culturally that you think evidence success for a project like this there versus here? So, so I will say that I only um, heard of one sort of negative uh, reaction to the the concept, and in St. Peter at least, and that was with respect to the wind. Uh, maybe I can quickly go back to that uh, shot of the wind energy, but and it was it was a very simple one. Uh, there are a few days of the year when the setting sun um, for certain homes, and I think the one that we're looking right at in this picture is probably one of them, um, is obstructed by the windmills as the sun goes down. And they actually get a, a flicker effect as the blades are turning uh, that have apparently disrupted some people. Now, the, you know, the person uh, that told this to me said it wasn't that big a deal, but you know that, that there was a there was um, a little bit of concern about that and and whether they're planting trees to try to sort of shade that particular angle or or do some other things that might um, ameliorate it I'm, I'm not sure but um, the more general question you know why aren't people so cranky about things um, in their neighborhoods uh, I, I think in general Germany has a very different relationship and expectation in terms of private property and land and community than we do um, so, you know, there's a, a long history of, of public ownership of much of the land and, and public management and collective management of a lot of the land. Uh, a lot of the forest land is in community forests. The city of Freiburg has thousands of hectares of forest that they manage collectively. Um, a lot of the land base is, is um, in long leases. And so I think all of those things have perhaps created a, a culture, an expectation that there will be community decisions that won't always benefit everyone, but that will benefit the
we have to be careful not to assume that there's no no conflict um, about this. I think there there may well be conflict, but the 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 way it's manifested may be different. Some of this may be cultural, and it may also um, you know be uh, you know be, because of the sort of um, you know policy avenues or protest avenues that people seem to um, feel that they have. Um, but I, you know, I, I, w I would be cautious about saying that people have embraced this in its entirety. Um, I think if one were to do more systematic research of a number of the communities, we would probably discover that there is a sort of, a, you know, a, a, a more convoluted and perhaps more fraught path um, towards the development of these bioenergy. Yeah, just to speculate, you know, within my own field of expertise, it seems like, you know, Germany has a, a very long tradition of forestry that really highlights fairly intensive management, especially compared to what happens in the U.S. Uh, with a lot more sort of public land attitude. Um, so I would imagine that those factors in terms of feedstock availability and favorability of use of that feedstock for something that's community energy based would be a lot more favorable. Okay, um, are there any last minute questions for either Tom, uh, Tom and Claire, or Mike? Uh, we can take any last couple here. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just mention that a recording of this presentation will be available through the new BIO website shortly within the next few days. So if you're interested in sharing it or reviewing anything that was uh, discussed today, please feel free to visit us on our website and find it there. Uh, if there are no last minute questions, I'll just ask uh, our speakers if there's any sort of last minute things they want to take away, uh, us to take away from this presentation. Tom? Well, um, you know, I, I guess I wanted to go back to this figure and just show, show the scale of the bioenergy expectation in, in Germany in terms of that nearly a quarter of their energy uh, from this resource. And, and uh, point out that it, we found it quite interesting that although renewables are the, the biggest part of the energy supply now in, in St. Peter and I think in many of the bioenergy villages, that they're called bioenergy villages and that, that rather than bioenergy being the sort of uh, stepsister or um, underling in, in terms of the, uh, the, the re renewable portfolio, in Germany it's right front and center and in fact is the guiding light for a lot of the, the rural uh, renewable energy activity. So that was quite different, quite refreshing for us, and, um, and quite interesting. And I think that has, uh, has to do with a long tradition. Um, in Germany, sustainability was developed, in fact, as a forest management strategy. And that, that legacy go that goes back over 300 years of thinking about long-term management, um, specifically around forests, has has come uh, full circle now in terms of, I think, paving the way for a, a much um, easier understanding and expectation and a friend friendly reception for Sounds good. Um, Add to that, I think it's um, what we've seen is that, you know, each country is different and a lot of the energy production is cultural related, history related, and so we can learn lessons from other countries and how they apply to our situations. And I think, you know, the, the Germany example is, is similar to the situation in the U.S. as compared to the Africa situation compared to the U.S. But, but um, what's important is to understand the local context and, and uh, adapt the energy situation to those uh, contexts. So that's Okay, I want to thank all of our speakers for a fantastic set of presentations. Um, thank you for taking us on the road and uh, teaching us more about your experiences while on sabbatical. Uh, we all appreciate it very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you.